Good morning. Welcome to the College of Communication and Information uh, Diversity and Inclusion Week. We've been celebrating uh, diversity over the course of the past few days with a number of sessions. And today we're going to be dealing with diversity in law enforcement. We're really fortunate to have on our panel a number of really distinguished individuals. And I'm going to go through these, not in any particular order, but I want to recognize them. Um, immediately to my left is uh, Corporal uh, Michael Emerson. He is with the Community Relations Unit with the U University of Tennessee Police. Uh, as part of the Community Relations Unit, he also does work with UT Campus Ministries Council. Actually, I'm not with the crew. I'm just a foot soldier. <laughs> the website but, needs uh, to be updated then. So yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm, we'll, uh, we'll, I'm a liaison between the police department and the ministry council. But yeah, I'm not with, with the Community Relations Unit. And he's also a good man to know if you get locked out of the communications building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in addition, then, to uh, Michael's left is a chief, police chief, uh, David Roush. He is the uh, chief of police for Knoxville Police Department. Uh, Lee Trammell, who uh, is going to be in between these two gentlemen, uh, is not here at the moment, but uh, we hope for him to join us. He's the assistant chief deputy for um, Knox County Sheriff's Office, and he's with the Criminal and Civil Warrants Division and Court Services Division. Uh, okay, then to the left is uh, Davis uh, Picari, and uh, he is with um, the Knoxville Orthopedic Clinic, Knoxville Orthopedic Clinic, uh, former student at the University of Tennessee, uh, and uh, to, the, to his left is uh, Julian Wright, who is also a former student at the University of Tennessee, uh, an artist. He recently had an exhibition of his art that I think took place earlier this month, um, and is also a self-employed disc jockey. Uh, so these are folks who are going to bring competing perspectives to the table in terms of how it is that uh, law enforcement and diversity may work, and they're also probably going to have a lot of areas of overlap. So I'm going to begin by asking uh, the folks who are on our panel today um, if they would share with us their views on how we go about building and maintaining a constructive <coughs> relationship uh, between law enforcement and the diverse communities and, that they serve. And so I'll ask any of my panelists to pick that up. Well, I, I don't mind going first on that one. Uh, First, thanks for, for having us, and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Great turnout. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I think probably more so than ever uh, in the history of, of, of law enforcement, uh, we have to have intentional efforts to build relationships. Uh, and, and the reality is that those relationships have to be built with uh, all that we serve. And, uh, and so there is a lot of effort in our, uh, in our department, in our community, uh, to do that very intentionally. And that means getting outside of our typical comfort zone uh, in law enforcement. And that is uh, spending more time to uh, get to know people and let them get to know us. You know, it's, it's easy uh, to create a divide uh, when you don't know the other person. Uh, it's easy to, to vilify uh, an individual if you don't know who they are. And it's easy to, uh, to, to uh, create uh, bias when you don't reach out and try to understand it. So uh, one of the main things that, uh, that we do uh, very intentionally is uh, put our officers out there in positions and situations where, uh, where they interact uh, and they get to know uh, those in our, in our community and, they, and, and the folks in our community get to know them. So we've done that through uh, working a lot with our faith communities. Uh, and, and I'd say faith communities, that's all faiths, uh, that, that uh, we send officers out and, and interact. And I personally go, uh, I've been with a, a number of our uh, our faith uh, partners throughout the community and uh, just sit down and have conversation. Um, one of the things that we've learned uh, brutally, quite frankly, is, um, is and, and nothing against this panel because I think panels are important, but uh, but panels you don't get the opportunity. I mean, it's typically one-way communication. And so what we really prefer is just sitting down in small groups and just having conversation, uh, getting to know each other, talking about our personal likes and dislikes about who we are, about what our job is, and about what we do, and about how we're trained. And, uh, because a lot of people don't understand what you get in the media, uh, what you hear on social media, what you see, uh, doesn't give all the facts. And it doesn't talk about the, the reality. You know, anytime an incident happens, people start screaming, more training, more training, more training. People don't understand the amount of training that we put law enforcement through. And, uh, and so it's really not the training that's the, the, the that the disconnect happens. Uh, it's, it's human beings is where that happens, right? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of working out these understandings and, and relationships, I think, is the key. I definitely agree. I want to piggyback off of you. My father is actually a lieutenant with the Sheriff's Department of Nashville. 
Um, so I had um, a very familiar life with law enforcement and uh, rules and regulations thereof. Um, based on personal experience, I know that the police department, what the relation, oh, louder, sorry, that the relationship uh, between the community and the community officers, um, like he says, sometimes takes a divide. And when it does take that divide, it sometimes takes even more energy to close that gap once the gap has been opened between the two. Um, I think great programs that I was um, introduced to, like uh, growing up in Great Camp and the Dare Camp that I attended, um, showed me a different side of police than what I thought. Showed me somewhat that police were superheroes. They were taking us places and teaching us things and building relationships with us. And I definitely think that programs like that uh, need to continue to exist and keep those relationships strong from childhood so that as I grow, I continue to look at you in the same manner. And I, I'm gonna have to go ahead and agree with my friend Julian here. As you know, more, more so than not now, it is terribly difficult to bridge this divide due to recent you know, things on social media and things that have happened, much controversy. So I think more so than ever now, the millennial generation coming up, it's sometimes difficult to, you know, believe what you see or to not have an immediate judgment towards a police officer that you see in your community, whether you know the facts or not. So I think what he was saying earlier, to bridge this divide, um, police need to be more present, um, not just in negative situations, not just to come take care of something. You need to be familiar with the cops in your area you need to be able to see that they're good people, they're just humans. It's not specifically just to come, you know, take care of something that's happened or for a negative situation. So maybe to implement some of these activities like Julian was talking about, you know, growing up, you are taught that cops, you know, adopt Mr. Friendly, you know, you should, a lot of people want to grow up to be cops, but these days I feel like just things that you're hearing stuff has really created more of a divide. So these programs to implement are having more police presence um, in a non-negative way that you know that they're just, you know, your friendly officer to help you, that would help a lot. Oh, um, I'm happy I'm fitting this chair today. I guess my perspective is interesting because I've kind of been on both sides. Because when I was a kid, man, I hated the cops. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, they would drive down the street, freaking pig, and hide behind the bush. I did all that. <laughs> So when people do it now, I'm like, okay, back at you, it's all good, karma. <laughs> but for me, when I was a kid, I was raised in the dirty south of Georgia and Florida. Uh, I've been frisked <coughs> illegally. I've been assaulted illegally. By, well, there's no legal assault. But I've been uh, pushed around by cops. I've been profiled by cops. All the stuff, well, I haven't been shot. But, uh, but I had all that, I, had, I grew up with that disrespect. I mean, I grew up with it and hated it. Hated pigs, hated fuzz, all the stuff we call them, because I'm 50 and I was raised in the 70s, so I'm going to get my age away as well. But the thing that made a difference for me is I met one police officer, a white gentleman named George Gilson, one guy. And what he did is he became friends with me. I, he went to my church, I'm real heavy in the church and God. And uh, I guess for some reason he saw something like, you know what, that's a pretty straight up dude. I'm going to get become friends with him. So me and George and I became friends. I was a little like this little at first. Okay, this guy gonna frisk me behind the church building or something, you know. But I uh, did a couple of ride-alongs with him, and that's what made a difference for me. So when I think about the community and I think about policing, I mean, I, when I was a kid, I was raised in the, well, I guess we're called the projects now, but uh, I mean, where everybody could spank every kid in the neighborhood. Everybody took care of each other. I got passed like a baton one day because I threw a rock at a lady's car. Okay, back in the days, of when it was a little different. But now what has happened is it seems like everything has made a flip now, okay? So my, my opinion on that is I just look at it as an, as an individual thing, you know, like, like the gentleman said here, being behind a desk, I mean, we're not, gonna get, we're not gonna accomplish anything here. If I talk to you out on the street, I guarantee that's where the change is gonna happen. So what I do is when I do traffic stops, when I have to do interactions, on the sidewalk. Unfortunately, yeah, there are some things. Sometimes I do have to take your rights when you when you have to be arrested. Sometimes I do have to confiscate things. But at the same time, if I come in with an attitude of respect, if I treat you like a human, if I'm cool and laid back with you, some of those things, some of those positive interactions, like it did for me, that's the thing that will flip. Because I've actually met a lady one time, and I'm a black officer, okay? She got mad. You put me up because I was black shit, dark tinted windows. I don't know how I could have known that. But as soon as I went and started talking to her, she kind of eased up because she started saying like, okay, this guy's not my enemy. This guy's just doing his job. So 
I see it as just an individual, the choices that I make and the choices that the community makes. If I choose to hate cops and hate, I mean, if I choose to hate the community, that's a choice I'm making. If I choose as a cop to hate the community, which there was a point I had to work through there because the media, I agree with the media, the media is just making it a circus right now. It's a choice. You choose if you want to accept truth or you choose if you want to seek the truth out and find out what the real deal is, you know. But for me, I see it as how do I treat people when I'm out on the street, you know, because that may be the only interaction that they get with a cop. You know, it may be the first cop and last cop they have for me. We live in a time of increasing transparency, and, and so probably that's one of the reasons why panels we're discussing what uh, we frequently see in, in the media. Um, how much transparency should we experience? When should that transparency begin? And when should that transparency end, as far as the public is concerned? I, I hate to keep starting off, but uh, um, so, so <laughs> I will tell you, transparency is, is important, and it's, and it's difficult. For law enforcement, uh, it's difficult because we work in, the, in this area of uh, of information that we have to protect at times uh, because of uh, because of situations that lead you know so so it's all about legality, right? Uh, I've got to be careful about what I look, what I release, so because I don't want to negatively impact a criminal case. So, so if I'm if I'm pushing everything out there, uh, and I do it too soon, uh, then the court system isn't able to do what they're supposed to do in a fair uh, manner that they're supposed to do it, right? And so, you have it's it's a balance. It really is this this balance of, of challenge with the information. You have to be careful, um, and and it's become even more challenging today. I, I think you know we try really hard. I, I've worked with. Um, with the White House on a number of initiatives that we are that, that we have implemented in transparency and uh, you know providing our data, providing our information so people can see it. That's that's unheard of in my profession. I, I've been in law enforcement now uh, almost 28 years, uh, county, uh, 24 years here and four years in the military, and and it's unheard of that we that we just open up our our information. Uh, and so, uh, but what we've really started to understand is it's not ours. You know, this information is the public's. It's your information. You should have access to it. And so, so we do that, uh, but, but you have to have some parameters. You have to do it when you can. Uh, you have to do it so that you don't impact negatively that case that you may be a victim in, right? And I don't want uh, your case to get ruined because I've done something, right? I want you to be successful in getting justice for your case. And so I have to be careful about that information, and, and that's that's the challenge. And you have to remember, even uh, even when it's involving a law enforcement officer, an incident that involves the officer, I have to respect his rights or her rights as well, right? So so I, I've got to think. You know, it's even though they're in that position, doesn't mean that they don't have rights. So when an incident happens, I have to respect all people's rights, and so I have to be careful about what I release. Uh, in terms of those types of things. Now, in, in ter terms of the data, we've got an open records page on our website where we release all of our, our, our what we call response to resistance. Others call it use of force. There's a reason for that different terminology. Uh, this is communications, and so I'll tell you, the, the terminology means a lot. right? Use of force makes it sound like we're seeking people to hurt. That's not what we do. Response to resistance is what we do. We're responding to the resistance of the individual that we're dealing with. Right, and so so that's that's really to frame it in the right mindset is what we do. I don't have officers that go out here seeking to hurt someone, right? And because if I do, and I dis and I discover that they're no longer a police officer, I can guarantee you that, right? Because because I have seen that, and we have dealt with that, and they don't work for us anymore. As a matter of fact, they got indicted, right? So so when you have those situations, because we deal with humans, right? You got to watch them. You got to monitor them. You got to pay attention to them. So, so it's key to, to to pay attention to that. But I think transparency is vital. But you have to be careful. You have to balance it. Uh, you know, in the recent incidents, you know, perfect two perfect examples we have today: Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Two perfect examples. Tulsa incident happened. They immediately released the videos. Immediate release, right? 
and explained what they were, their next steps were going to be. Um, Tulsa has had no incidents, no issues. Charlotte, North Carolina, they held the video. They didn't release it, and they had right, right? And, and now they have released it, and the information is out there, right? But it took them too long. You know, and that's and that's a tough. And I get, I understand where these my peers have sat down and tried to decide, right? You know, do we release it? Do we not release it? What are we, you know, what are we compromising if we release? Um, and what do you, what's the challenge if you don't? And unfortunately, that's a that's a tough decision that in, individuals in my responsibility, my role, have to make. And and you know, always what we have to do is think about the greater good. And, and so it's 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 a tough decision. Um, transparency is important, but you have to be careful that when you utilize that transparency that you're not jeopardizing someone's rights. Uh, and so that's that's the tough balance. I would have to go ahead and agree with what he said. It's something you already think about because when you see these things happening in recent activities, of course you want them to be as transparent as possible. Um, you want to see everything that happened immediately. You know these cops are all mic'd up, wired up. You can see his camera right there. Um, but he made a good point with uh, there's a very fine line because if you immediately release absolutely everything, then you could be jeopardizing a lot of legalities and you could, you know, as far as social media goes, people hear about it immediately, people can say whatever they want about it and whatever viewpoints you want to hear. And that immediately, like he said, can cause riots, can cause anything else. So, you know, I'm not a police officer, but he makes a very good point that of course we want to see everything, but to a certain extent. You got to keep it legal, but, um, you know, if something's wrongfully done or anything, of course we need to know, and we'd like to know. And I think that's the reason that everybody has these cameras and everything else. So <coughs> transparency can be both good and bad, but to a certain extent, you need an increasing level of transparency. I'd have to agree. Okay. Yes, you guys can call me Mr. Personal because I'm very personal about everything. But kind of look at it this way. Uh, let's say there's a case against your mom, your dad, you. Okay, how much, do, how much do you want the public to know about it? I mean, just kind of take a minute and just think about it. Do you want the public to know every little detail of what's going on, or do you want to let the investigation go ahead and run its course and then let it go out? So the way I see it is, I mean, it's like this gentleman said, it's just, it's just one of those shades of gray. It's just, I mean, when do you release and when do you not release? I don't know what the, what the ground is on. I guess it just depends on what the case is. But you have to just look at it as a, a fellow human being because all these, because all right, we have to protect the people that we're, <coughs> that we're doing investigations on. We have to protect everybody. So whenever these things happen, and you start getting frustrated about, well, I don't know what's going on, why the, just kind of take a breath and look back, okay, if this was me in this spot, or if this was my mom, my dad, or my little brother, how much do I want the police to release to the whole public? I, I mean, how much do I want everybody in the world to know? Because once we know, it becomes on social media. It's all, I mean, once it goes to media, where does it go? Bam, it's everywhere, okay? So just kind of just kind of take a look at it. How much do you want the public to know? I, don't, I mean, I hear this all the time. The public, we had a right to know, we had the right to know. I don't know if I'm, I mean, I, the public has a right to know, but when does, when does the public have a right to know? So just kind of, just kind of let that jog around in your brain and think about it a little bit. But, uh, but like I said, if you were in that case, if you were in that position, family member, how much of the public, how much do you want the public to know right then and there when it happened? Does that make sense? Right. I have one more question, and I want to open this up to questions from the students. Um, stop and frisk and other policies like this have been the subject of some national debate. What kinds of policies should police departments adopt that will keep the community safe, but at the same time protecting the rights of the citizens? I, I think it's simple. Uh, constitutional policies, right? They need to be uh, within the framework of the Constitution, right? I, I think that's that's first and foremost. Um, you know, and, and so I will tell you, stop and frisk is one of those that uh, has constitutional challenges. And so, you know, it, it, just to stop you and to pat you down is is not appropriate. I got to have a reason. I've got to be able to articulate that suspicion, right? Just because I stopped you to talk to you, that's not enough. Uh, you know, I got to take into consideration why I'm stopping you, what the reason is, where you're at, that location. Is it a location that is a high crime location where, you know, guns are prevalent uh, or violence is prevalent? 
And then I need to articulate that to you. I need to explain to you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, and, and so that's, that's absolutely key. Uh, but, but just stopping and starting to pat somebody down, absolutely inappropriate. Uh, it's not constitutional. Uh, it's, it's, so I, I, think, I think you have to be careful uh, and your policies have to reflect the Constitution. Uh, and so I, mean, I think it's that simple. Yeah, for me coming from the background of being stopped and first illegally before I was a cop, <laughs> I already gotten that a few minutes ago. Uh, something I take it really personal as well. So for me, and uh, I mean, you guys may be wanting to hear it from the perspective of a, of a law enforcement officer. If I stop and frisk anybody, I've got to be able to articulate why I did. I just don't run up, hey, dude, come here, let me check you. There are steps that I have to go through. There's reasons I have to have to be able to do that. So, um, but it's got to be within the Constitution. Believe it or not, law enforcement, what our job is, is to protect the Constitution. That's really what we do. You know, we protect your rights. Anybody who violates your rights, guess what we do? We come in and we take care of it. Um, I'm going to jump in. I of course, I agree, it's a very constitutional right, but as we all know, oftentimes, if it's one-on-one -on -one and they know that it may be a situation they can take advantage of, you know, personally, I've been stopped and frisked more than half a dozen times. You know, young white male, whatever else, even just traffic, my music too loud is one of the reasons. And I've been stopped and searched, you know, stopped and I've asked them what the reason is and they just either tell me to, you know, shut up or, you know, mm -hmm. if it's one-on-one, -on -one, of course, that's not the typical situation, but that is a good question is how do we, like we said, what, what kind of policies do we put it forth to make it a more constitutional thing? I know we have the cameras and everything else, but may have been a different scenario, but I've you know, never been granted the not frisk before. I've definitely been stopped and frisked, um, but I know that in certain areas, uh, I grew up in North Nashville, so police know what's going on over there, so um, I guess it more so needs to focus on, you know, what is the probable cause, like you said. Um, how threatening am I when you're passing me that you need, that you feel the need to stop me or, you know, in certain situations like that. So I definitely agree with everything that you said. Um, just look for the probable cause and then take action. Yeah, that would probably also be accountability with departments because, um, unfortunately, I mean, I'm not an officer in your area. You know, and and it makes me mad that officers did that to you. Okay, unfortunately, there's nothing I can really do about that. Those officers, but um, but one good thing about body cameras is is that it does capture that. You know, so if I do anything illegally, guess what? What there it is. You know, so um, <laughs> but um, but here's my thing: when that happens, like I say. And you guys, I'll tell you what, there's, there's a lot of good that you guys do have that I didn't have because I was in the 70s and the 80s. You guys do know your rights. Back then, I had no clue. I thought it was perfectly okay. I had Billy Bo job, Billy Bo John, sheriff guy pulled me over one night, come home from work in Golden Corral, put me out of the truck, pat me down like a pizza. All right, well, I guess you're okay, boy. Go on home. And I went back to my truck, and I was like, dang, what's that about? But see, I had no clue, you know. The thing about you guys now that you do know your rights, and that's one thing I do like. But here's the thing about it, though: when those incidents do happen, then just go ahead and comply. Then take your day in court whenever that time comes. You know, don't fight the cop on the street. I mean, there's times I could have done that. My little brother, a little bit different personality. Okay, he's a little bit more vocal. That old picks do quit. We don't want to go to jail now. So when those things do happen, you know, unless the worst happens. Just go ahead, comply, do what you're supposed to do, and then you get your day in court and talk about it. If this guy, if this officer unjustly patted you down, then you'll have your day in court. If you win, you'll probably end up on that police department. And, and he makes a great point that you know, compliance is, is key. What we're seeing, uh, quite frankly, when you see these incidents that have, that have become so viral, um, is compliance is what's lacking, right? And, and that's in the majority. Is compliance comply and complain later that's that's the key to this is if you're being uh, mistreated uh, if if someone is doing something that you know in your mind what they're doing is improper and illegal right comply and then complain right 
that, that's the key to it. The resistance is where the bad things have been happening, right? You, you, in your mind, you know what they're doing that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, the vast majority of these things are on video. So you take that video and you go to the department and you make your complaint, all right? That's the way, that's the way it's handled. And, and if you don't feel like that department will properly do it, then there's different ways, right? There are, you, you can go, there's, depending on where you're at, uh, there are civilian uh, oversight in a lot of departments now. You go to that civilian oversight. Uh, or if you don't have that, you go to the DA's office. If you don't have that, or if you don't have a DA that you think that will do it, and, I, and I've heard, you know, I've heard, well, you know, little, little town over here, everybody's all together, then go to the FBI. Right, or go to the state uh, level of investigation. Those are all in place for that reason, for, for that purpose, uh, is to assure that we're doing our job the way we're supposed to be doing it. Right? And if we're not, then it needs to be discovered, and it needs to be brought forward, and we need to deal with it. But don't, don't try on the street, right? Because it's, it's, we've seen, unfortunately, uh, the, the horrible, Results to that. Don't don't try to fight it on the street. Uh, comply. Do what they tell you to do. They put you in handcuffs and put you in the car and take you to jail. Just get ready, right? Just get ready. And and, and, and the key is you'll survive that encounter. That's the key. Survive that encounter and then let's get it straight, right? That's the way to do it. That's the way you're successful. That's the way we bring these things to light. Uh, and, and it works. It absolutely works. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the key to it. All right, we have a few minutes for some questions, so. Good morning. Um, say your name and just ask a quote. Just ask. <laughs> okay, well, my name is Natasha Webb right there. Um, I have a few questions, but I'll just ask one for now. Um, the term community policing has been somewhat been thrown around um, in the news and different outlets. I was wondering, one, how do you feel about that rhetoric of the term community policing? And if you all would believe that requiring police officers to actually live in the neighborhoods in which they police would be beneficial? Community policing, I know it exists. We see police like Tommy, uh, what is it, Tommy Norman. Uh, I grew up in Nashville. There's an officer named uh, Julius Gallen who not only was in our community, but even came up to my graduation slash graduation party, like things like that. Like, but I know that you are the law enforcement officer over my community. I, I, and I understand your role and I respect you because of the position that you took. But community policing, a community is a team, you know? We have to be a team, but if we are enemies, if we are, if we see each other as ops, then that's an issue. And that is where the term community is thrown out the window and it's simply policing. And I don't know what kind of policing that is when it's not in a sense of a family or community. Y'all yeah, agree with that. I'll, I hate the term community policing. <laughs> I mean, and here's what I mean by that. Is I just see it as <clears throat> policing. That's the way I view it. It's like if I work at McDonald's, I'm not like a Big Mac technician, whatever, you know. <laughs> I mean, I just make Big Macs, right? Okay. As a police officer, what do I do? I protect my community. I love my people. I play with the kids on the side of the street. I mean, I just do my job, you know. Now, I guess there's a, I guess there's a place for the work community to police, and it, I mean, I think it's a good concept. And, it, and, it's, and it's, I mean, me personally, I love the community. I mean, I always have. Was raised in it, have good memories in the street and playing and things like that. I just see it as, you know, it may be a it may be a term that's been coined for the politi politically correct. Maybe I don't know, but as a police officer, just doing your normal everyday activities, you're 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 a community police officer regardless. As far as living in the community, that sounds good, but it's not realistic because for me, I live out in West Knoxville. And that means I would have to move on campus. So it's, I don't think it's a bad idea. <laughs> so I don't think it's a bad idea because I was. I'm also. I've been a youth pastor for a number of years before I did this job, and I actually did live in the community 
where I was working with kids and adults and stuff. So, so it's a great, it's a great concept. I think it would be beneficial, but also um, I don't know how feasible it would be for an officer to actually to, to pick up and relocate. But I think I understand. In other words, the officer needs to live with the same people that he serves. That could be good and bad because if I have to arrest, you know, bulldog across the street from me. That could be that could kind of put me and my family in jeopardy too. So there's, it, it, it for me it sounds it sounds like it would be cool, but on the other hand, if I had to take action against the guy across the street from me with bad results, then that I mean my 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 safety and my family safety is going to come first. So I don't really I don't really have an answer for that. One. As a youth pastor, it was great. You know, there were people I served with. Police officer, as a youth pastor, I didn't arrest and chase people. So. Um, so I'll, I would be more concerned about that officer's safety, depending on where he lived and who he had to deal with, you know. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I have a little different perspective um, on, on a couple of these issues. One is community policing. So com community policing is a philosophy. It's not an act. It's not an effort. It's a philosophy. It's, it's an understanding <coughs> of the focus that you're going to have. And, and that is engaging the community and protecting that community, right? It's, it's, uh, so it, it's not, it's, you know, and, and unfortunately what's happened in, in the history of, of and, and I know it well because I, I, one, I've lived it and I've studied it. So, uh, but, uh, so, so, as a matter of fact, my pastor's thesis was on it. So, um, <laughs> I, know, I know a little bit about it. Um, so, so it's really more of an understanding of how uh, you approach the job of policing, right? Uh, unfortunately, law enforcement agencies created it as a project, right? They, they assigned people to community policing units, and then they gave them these roles of going out and, and organizing, uh, being community organizers, and uh, being that, that person that, uh, that went into the community and led community meetings, and, and those types of things. Um, there's no reason to have a specific unit to do that. Every officer should be trained in communicating. Every officer should be trained in engagement. Every officer should be trained in caring for the community, as, 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 as Officer Emerson says. It, it, it's, it's every officer's responsibility to do community policing, right? It, it's a philosophy. Um, in terms of living in the community, uh, I get that question a lot. You know, I, I do have, I'm responsible for the officers that work in this city. Uh, we have uh, a take-home program where they can take their car home. Uh, it's an extension of security for our community. That par car parked in a neighborhood uh, keeps that neighborhood safe. Uh, the fact that that car is there, uh, it, it keeps that neighborhood safe. Uh, and so having that out in the community is wonderful, right? And so what we've done is we've kind of drawn, because here's the challenge, is, uh, is, is how much do you want me to control uh, uh, those employees that work for me, hmm. right? And so, uh, it, and unlike any other employee, right? You can work for the University of Tennessee and live wherever you want, right? As long as you can get here on time to get to work. Uh, <coughs> heck, you could live in Atlanta if you want to drive those, you know, those two and a half hours. Uh, but so, so any other employer in our city, you, you can you can live uh, wherever you want. And and I I would tell you, the University of Tennessee has just as large a responsibility. To this community as the Knoxville Police Department has the same level of responsibility to assuring that we have a good community to live in right and so every employee here is responsible for that every employee that works at the TVA uh, Tennessee Valley Authority has the same responsibility every employee that works at, at Scripps Networks has that same responsibility to this community right and so requiring just because we're police requiring us to have to live here in this community now I do I live right across the river. Um, just, as a matter of fact, you can see my place right across. The, so, so uh, but, but, you know, so I do live in this community. Uh, and I don't have any challenges and, you know, and, and concerns. And uh, I, I don't, I'm not concerned about my safety. I, I do understand, you know, I don't do as much as I used to do in terms of putting people in jail. Um, and, and I do understand that concern of someone, you know, wanting to, to seek revenge on that. But, that, that's really not not what goes on in my mind. My mind is, you know, the fairness again. Considering these are all humans, right? 
and I want to treat you the same as, as any other employer in this town would treat you. Um, does it change, you know, so I guess my question would be, do you think that them living in the community would change the way they police? And, and I'm not sure that I see that. I would expect them to police fairly constitutionally uh, following the color of law uh, and, and being engaged in the community, um, regardless if they live here or not. Uh, I've, I've lived outside of this community when I was a young officer and didn't stop my engagement in this community. I still served on boards and on nonprofits. I still uh, did, did uh, all of the community engagement uh, efforts. Um, so, so I think it's, it's deeper than just living here. Uh, I think it's, are you engaged here? Is this your community in terms of your effort? Right? And so I, I, I don't think the physical space you live in has any impact on how you perform uh, your responsibility. I definitely agree. I don't necessarily feel that they have to live um, in a certain area. But I know growing up in the early 90s, and I know years before me, there were police that, you know, foot, foot patrol. Sure. And I know probably how effective that was. And I know growing up seeing a police, simply seeing the same police walk by me every week is was a happy feeling seeing this guy. So and, um, I feel like that can uh, be re-implemented as well. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll keep A right here and then Z question. We'll come back. Maybe. Okay. Hi, Lisa Oliver. Um, I am not involved in law enforcement or anything like that. Uh, I've lived in a lot of different neighborhoods as a kid, and I got the uh, the speech of comply and do that, and you'll get out of it. <coughs> That's not new, but I noticed in some of the um, videos that everybody sees online, some of these people are mentally challenged. They don't know what you're screaming at them. There's that communication is going out from the police officers, but at the same time, it doesn't sound like they're listening to the response. They're just seeing that person still flailing around, but they're not listening to somebody next to them saying, he's disabled, he can't understand you. How do you address that issue? That, that's training. That, that, that comes down to training. Um, you know, especially in the past, probably 15 years, um, we have seen more, unfortunately, of our untreated mental health uh, uh, individuals in our communities uh, engaging, uh, and, or us having to engage them. And so uh, the effort has been to, you know, there's a model that was created in Memphis, actually. Uh, it's called the Memphis Model. Um, it, it's, a, it's a crisis intervention team and training concept. Um, and that is, uh, and it was actually created in the 1980s. And that, that model uh, resulted from a negative uh, interaction where an officer shot a, a, a mentally uh, ill person and, uh, uh, and it could have been avoided with, with training. And so that training is pretty prevalent now. We actually, in our academy, we train every one of our officers. It's a 40-hour block of instruction on crisis intervention. We have mental health professionals come in and train them uh, on how to deal with those with mental illness. Uh, how to recognize the signs, how to, you know, to, to disengage, right? And, and then to slow things down, and then to try to figure out what we need to do to, to, to uh, resolve the situation in a peaceful manner. And so that's, that's a lot of training is what, that, what, what requires that, uh, what's required. Um, and, and that's catching on. Uh, that, that Memphis model, that while it's been around for 30 years, uh, it, it's, it's new to a lot of police departments. There are a lot of agencies that are just now hearing about it and just now getting engaged in it, and just now learning uh, the model. I know the University of Tennessee Police Department has officers that are CIT trained. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, the, we have seen the great advantage to it, quite frankly. Uh, we have seen things de-escalate and things get under control where normally you would go try to throw hands on and then everybody piles on and things go back, right? Um, where you just back off, figure it out, have conversation, and understand, you know, try to evaluate what you're dealing with. 
and, and then uh, your contact and connection is different. So it's training. Uh, I've seen that the, the one video specifically. Um, you know, it's another one again. A lot of these videos you look at, and, and you see them differently than I see them. I can tell you, right? Um, I'm looking at them from my trained eye, and and what I know in terms of what the officer should be doing and how they should be responding. And then I also understand the human error that happens, right? Uh, and so you have you can't discount uh, that, that the human factor exists. You just can't discount it. Uh, it's it's the reality of it. I can train. I can train you, uh, I can prepare you, uh, I can get you out there and have you with all the knowledge and skills and abilities to do this job, but I can't control the human element. I can't control how you're going to respond when stress kicks in. I can train you in it, uh, but I don't know how it's going to happen when reality hits. And so that's, that's the most difficult part of training, is we can train you up. We can have you prepared, we can have you ready to go, but that human element is going to come into play. Uh, and so, you know, the, the thing to think about it, when you see all of these things that we're seeing, right, think about the number of incidents that nothing adverse happens, right? You know, we always, this is, it's, and again, this is a human function. We always want to focus in on the negative incidents, always, in our lives. And I mean, we always give all the energy to the negative. And we never consider what the alternative and the positives have been, right? But literally in this country, we have 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country, right? Over literally tens of millions of contacts that don't go bad, right? So, so I think if you think in, in, in that light and put it in perspective, it, it helps you kind of frame what's happening. Those are the outliers. Now, doesn't mean we ignore them. Doesn't mean that we just say, well, it's, you know, it doesn't happen that often, so we don't have to be concerned. We do have to be concerned. We have to take those, learn from those, and make sure that those don't happen again. Right? And, 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 and unfortunately, there are times where it's a human issue. Tulsa, I, I can tell you, I've looked at the Tulsa incident. Uh, that female officer had no intent to shoot that individual. No intent whatsoever. That's why I don't think their charge is going to stand. Now, she should have been charged. That's not what I'm saying. What she should have been charged with is negligent homicide. Because what her actions were were negligent. They weren't criminal intent to, co to commit homicide. Right? She didn't make a conscious decision to shoot and kill that individual. What happened to her, and I can tell you, this is all science. It's, 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 so there's a whole thing called force science, right? And so this is all science. What happened is there's this thing, 60% of law enforcement officers do this unconsciously. When they have their firearm out, we know the rule is keep your finger off the trigger until you've made the conscious decision to fire, right? That's the rule. We all understand it. We all know it. We've all been trained in it. But here's the thing. Subconsciously, here's what happens. 60% of law enforcement officers will do what they call feathering. And feathering is reaching to make sure the trigger's still there. Now, it seems crazy, right? But that's what they do because of the stress. And so they want to make sure, if they need it, that the, that the trigger's there. So they put that finger in there and they touch, right? And then what happens is if they get startled, the gun goes off, right? And we've seen it, not just once, we've seen it multiple times. That's what happened in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I guarantee you. When the, when the officer beside her shot the taser, which is the appropriate response, it startled her, and the gun went off. And an individual's dead because of it, right? Uh, those things happen. That's human reaction, right? And I can train you and train you and train you to keep your finger off the trigger. But unconsciously, subconsciously, your finger's going there for 60% of those that work in this field, right? And so, so you know, it's unfortunate. We, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that it happens.
Hi, I'm, I'm Maria Hoy. I'm, I'm faculty here. And I'd like to uh, piggyback on your comment about stress. Well, everybody has job stress. When your all's job stress gets to you, it has different consequences than when my job stress gets to me. Sure. How often are the officers evaluated on how they are doing? Is it an annual review so every 12 months you look at them? Or is it a, how regular is that? So you can assess and, and intervene or pull them out or whatever the needs may be. Unfortunately, in law enforcement, we're not there yet. We're not, we're not where we should be. Um, and it's agency to agency. Did you all hear what she asked? Oh, uh, yeah, but I was going to add on to that. Sure. Do they have access to provided yes. counseling? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, good question. So, so unfortunately, we, we're not there where we, you know, I continue to fight and advocate for an annual review. Just like we, I have to have an annual physical every year. I have to go, every year I have to get a, a medical <coughs> physical every year, right? And, and so they're checking everything from the neck down, right? They need to check from the neck up as well, all right? And so uh, I, I do believe that there should be an annual uh, evaluation, uh, an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation. Um, we're not there yet in law enforcement. Um, we're getting there. But, but we, do have, we do have things available. We do have, um, we, we do have an employee assistance program that, we, that actually in our city, our law enforcement agency uses it more than any other city employees. Uh, that, that our officers can go and talk to someone uh, professional. Uh, we have other things that we have. Uh, we have a chaplain support. We have 35 chaplains who volunteer uh, for our agency. There is a chaplain on duty every day, 24 hours. And those chaplains are present for officers to talk with them, and they do. Uh, we also have a peer support team uh, that, that uh, officers can reach out to and have conversations where their peers who have been through these things that they can have conversations with them. So, so there, are, there are a number of, of avenues. We're not at the annual check, which I really think is, is vital for us. There are agencies that have on-staff psychologists. We don't have them. Um, and, and those are valuable as well. What, uh, what mental evaluation is ever put in place? Like how, do you guys ever go through one? Or how does it work? Yeah, initially you'll go through a mental evaluation. So in order to be hired as a law enforcement officer, a psychological exam is, is part of the process of being hired. Okay. So you, you'll go through a full psychological. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. So I didn't mean to take all the time. One more time. I believe we have about time for one more question from members of the audience. So obviously with all the recent tragedies that have happened and the re releasing of videos has obviously caused chaos, which caused chaos such as Charlotte. I know that either the state of North Carolina is either in the process or they've already done it since then to not release police videos either until after the court or trial date or maybe not at all. Do you agree or disagree with that? And where would you like to see Tennessee, I mean, Tennessee stamps on that? So, so I'm very engaged and involved in, in our legislative efforts uh, and have a lot of conversation with our legislators at the state level. Um, so I, I think that it has to be a balance. I think, I think you can't cut and dry these things. I, I think there has to be a balance. I think you've got to give um, law enforcement the opportunity to uh, make the decision that's best for the situation. Um, it, it's just hard to make it cut and dry and say everything gets released or you don't release anything or you release this and you don't release that. I think those, those just become very difficult. I think you've got to continue to have kind of a checks and balances system in place. Uh, and, and Sorry, turn out the lights. Uh, uh, but, but I think that checks and balances, I think you've got to be careful. You know, unfortunately, what you'll find as you, as you continue in your lives is uh, we tend to try to legislate everything. Uh, and, and, and that takes common sense out of things. And it also takes that ability to uh, use discretion. And I think we don't want to get away from having discretion on a lot of, a lot of what we do uh, as, as, a, as a community, as, as a public. We have to be careful not to, not to limit our discretion uh, too much. And so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of challenge with video. I, you know, one of the things I've been fighting, you know, talking about body cameras, uh, is, you know, that, that under, currently under Tennessee open records law, anything that's captured on that camera is open record. I have a problem with that 
when you've called me to your home in one of your darkest moments. And I enter your home to help you through that dark moment. And now that video is available for anybody to see. I, got a, I have major problems with that. You know, the, 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 the world doesn't need to see when you've had trouble. Right? And so I think there's some protection that needs to be put in place. Yeah, no, I agree. Right. Yeah, obviously, each case is different. It, but each you know, case. Like, so that's why I say putting an in, you know, all or none. Yeah, I think no, you've got to. Dr. Hoss, we have about 11, or excuse me, about six or seven minutes. This session does conclude at 11 or 5. But I want to ask a question. There are many citizens out there at this particular time that say our system is broken. And um, many people have tried to comply when being arrested, but they have ended up without a life. What do you say, how do we fix that um, to make sure that all citizens are accountable, held accountable for what they do and um, be it out in the community, be it the police officers, what can be done in order to to bring about healing? Because um, you know this isn't going to go away. No, you you, you absolutely hit it where, where it is, and that's accountability. Accountability is the reason we're seeing rioting. Um, you know, there's this there's this frustration that exists because. Uh, there's this feeling that accountability does not exist. And, and it has been waning. It has been lacking. Um, and that is a leadership issue. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I know that because, um, because of how we deal with things here. Right? Uh, one of the things that I have made as part of my, I, I've been chief here for a little over five years. And in my tenure, uh, I have had to hold a lot of people accountable. Uh, and it's not fun, it's difficult, uh, and it takes a, a, a true, unbelievable believable level of courage to do it. Um, you know, but I have seen, uh, I've had to indict four officers uh, in my short tenure as a, as a chief. Uh, I have seen many others that I have had to disinvite from law enforcement. That's a nice way of saying fire. Right, um, and and so it, it's 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 difficult, but that's that's the issue. So yes, I think I think it's a couple of things. I think our system needs to be needs to be reformed. What 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 you hear the politicians see, and that's another thing. When I hear politicians say reform, they're not talking what I'm talking. Right, that what they call reform is not. Reform. What, what we need is real, true reform in our system, where we sit down and we have an open conversation about fairness, and it's not about economic fairness, <laughs> right? Because economic, what, what we see is if you ain't got the money to hire the best attorney, then you're going to face worse consequences than that person who has the money to hire the best attorney. Our system has been set up that way, and it's an absolute horrible way of handling justice. Uh, and so, you know, there does need to be reform, but it needs to be done on the highest levels. Uh, and, and it's, and, and unfortunately, we in uniform, we're, we're the easy target. We're the ones everybody easily can come after because we're the most visible, we're the most present. And so it's easy to come after us. It's really easy. But where we need to be really aiming putting our sights is at the judicial level is at the legislative level that's where reform really needs to happen that's where fairness needs to be created uh, and leadership is a key uh, leaders in this country and leaders in my in my profession need to step up and be leaders they need to step up and have the courage to hold people accountable and, and I, I think when we see that movement happen, then we see these things get resolved. Right? I, I honestly believe that. I think it's also up to us as citizens, which we're all citizens, but um, while you all are on the clock, because we know police don't get paid a million dollars to patrol the world. 
And that is why I have an appreciation. Like I said, my father's a lieutenant with the sheriff's department, so much appreciation always. But I think it's like how many people out here <coughs> go to like concerts and stuff, festivals, Bonnaroo, blah, blah, blah. And then y'all probably go out to eat as well, to restaurants and stuff. And we always tell our waiters thank you, but when we leave Bonnaroo and concerts, we don't bother to tell the police who stopped somebody from bringing a gun or bomb inside the concert, thank you. And I think it starts from us as well, forming that relationship and letting them know that we do appreciate you every day. You are putting on a uniform and you are instantly making somebody upset just by putting on your uniform and leaving your house. Somebody hates you. And, and the, you are an individual who has probably a life, family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it just can't be the case that way. So it's just a lot of re reform, even more than government. It's us as a people. And the, we, us, as we renew our minds and recollect on the relationship that once did exist between the community and law enforcement. That's true. I think you hit the nail on the head. And it is increasingly difficult to do. Just as you said, it's not that easy to just say, we appreciate you police officers and yada yada, because it's almost every day you're going to hear something negative about them and see a negative video. So where do we actually draw the line where we can see some reform and start appreciating the officers that are not on the negative side of things? Because that's a select few, but you're going to hear about it because it is a very negative thing that they've been doing. For those police that are working hard to do right, to act right, to be lawful, to be legit about their jobs, definitely deserve recognition if we're going to continuously recognize those negative couples. So, thank you. Great thank you. <laughs> but I think we're just about out of time. So if you all would please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> okay, I'm Alice Worth, Chair of Diversity and Inclusion Week. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Haas for um, moderating and assembling the panel. I also want to thank Mike, I'm going to get right the right name, Emerson, um, David Roche, and Roche. Okay, first of all, thank you two for serving our community. We need to take all of you to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Davis Parkari and Julian Wright. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just our third day of our Diversity Inclusion Week. Later on this um, afternoon from 1215 to 1:15, we have diversity, inclusion, and politics. Tonight in the McClung Museum from 545 to 645, we have our, our keynote person, Aleka Williams from Scripps talking on leadership and diversity and her personal story. Not to be missed, uh, 545 to 645. And then our culminating activity is tomorrow. It is free uh, for each and every one of you to come from 5 to 7. We call it our diversity festival where we'll have Dr. Haas, the dean, and directors making hamburgers, hot dogs, veggie burgers, entertainment, cultural performances. You two may come. Um, it is just open. We have henna, uh, bouncy houses. You have the kids want to bouncy houses. Just, huh? Angela's got Twister. Twister. We've got, uh, we've got all types of activity. It is free. We want this house rocking. Photo booths. Uh, it is free. It is open to everybody. I know this is my way. I think it's nice for each one of us to come out of our silos and to learn about one another in a different perspective. Again, you're all invited. Please come. But again, a round of applause for our panel.